Hey everyone, and welcome back to my Baldur's Gate completionist playthrough with uh, SCS. We've finished this floor, and now we can proceed further up. By the way, this music here is just so awesome, this choir music. In general, when it comes to Baldur's Gate soundtrack, in, in general, it's pretty much like unmatched by anything. But it, also like a special mention has to be uh, made about the temple music and the tavern music in Baldur's Gate. Like, those are just so good. The temple music is usually subtle, but gives you that... Uh, that feeling of being in, in this sacred, holy place of worship. And the tavern music is just so good, gives you that warmth, that joyous feeling of being, like, in a safe tavern to rest. In general, the, the music in Baldur's Gate is just fantastic. Anyway, here, there's not too much to do on this floor, because uh, there's this whole, like conference room, I guess, this whole chamber here that we're not going to visit just yet. We're going to be back here in, uh, soon, and I'm going to elaborate uh, more when we uh, when we get there. Alright, here is Shistol, uh, the fellow that Bendalis mentioned, that uh, he acted very, very strangely as of late, as if he was a completely different person. And of course that's not far from the truth, as we will see. So he refers to us as a stranger, and she, he should be able to recognize us, since we of course spent our whole childhood here, our first like 20 years of life. Uh, so he asks about how our trip to Cloakwood has been, and like, how does he even know about that? So he mentions that he has relatives in the region, but he never mentioned any family before. And apparently they are not close to each other. Anyway, I think you were lying to me, Shistel. You are not the same man I knew. Yeah, I'm tired of this game. Take your questions and go away, monkey. Oh no, I have many more questions to ask. For starters, who are you really? I am your death, foolish meat. Anyway, this is our first encounter with a greater doppelganger. And they have some spells at their disposal, they have better stats. But this one isn't particularly dangerous, especially since he is alone. There are some points later in the game where you meet more of them and uh, some better versions of them, I guess. That have some more spells at their disposal that can be hasted and uh, are generally more of a threat. Yeah. Right here we're going to take some poor fellow's gold from under his pillow. <laughs> That's uh, very funny. And now I'm going to temporarily give these boots of speed to Koran so he can just quickly go and unlock some containers. I'm not going to risk it. I don't think this guy sees me here, but I want to take the contents of this chest. There's a potion of fortitude there. Here is like nothing. Yeah, There's not much in, in these rooms, uh, but in this bookshelf there are two scrolls that I want, web and detect invisibility. And by the way, if you're familiar with Baldur's Gate 2, you will probably recognize this room because this is the exact room where one of the dreams happen. Because in Baldur's Gate 2, dreams are not narrated. They're not you know, described in text, but they are more like in-game sequences. And one of them happens right here, in this very room. And in, in this uh, container there's a wand of fear that I'm not even going to bother to pick up. And there are some like minor treasures. I just want this guy to move. Okay, that's very nice. Koran is going to transfer some of his goodies. Oh, this container is full again. Anyway, I just want this potion. And now we can proceed upstairs. It's going to be level 5 of the library. And here's Piato, or Piato. Good to see you. I trust you are well. So how have, how have you been, dude? Oh, I pine for the days when you and Gorion still called Candlekeep home. You brought a bit of energy to these walls. I shall have to speak with you later at length, but for now you must rest. Gorion's old room is the third on the, on the south corridor, just as it was. I think there are a few things for you there as well. We shall see you later. So yeah, this is Gorion's room, as he shows us to it. And this is a very significant point in the game. Because this is where we shall finally get some hard answers about about everything. Pretty much everything now is going to make sense. So here's a letter to us. 
from Gorion himself. And I'm going to read this out loud because this I love this letter. Although I have two minor, minor gripes with it. Anyway. Hello, Senashira. If you're reading this, it means I have met an untimely death. I would tell you not to grieve for me, but I feel much better thinking that you would. There are things I must tell you in this letter that I might have told you before. However, if my death came too soon, then I would have never been given the chance. First off, I am not your biological father, for that distinction lies with an entity known as Baal. The Baal that I speak of is the one you know of as a divinity. In the crisis known as the Time of Troubles, when the gods walked Faerun, Baal was also forced into a mortal shell. He was somehow forewarned of the death that awaited him during this time. For reasons unknown to me, he sought out women of, or women of every race and forced himself upon them. Your mother was one of those women, and as you know, she died in childbirth. I had been her friend and, on occasion, lover. I felt obligated to raise you as my own. I have always thought of you as my child, and I hope you still think of me as your father. You are a special child. The blood of the gods runs through your veins. If you make use of, your, of our extensive library, you will find that our founder, Alondo, has many prophecies concerning the coming of the spawn of Baal. There are many who will want to use you for their own purposes. One, a man who calls himself Saravok, is the worst danger. He has studied here in Candlekeep, and thus knows a great deal about your history and who you are. Gryan. Dang, man. Those are some pretty heavy revelations, dude. <laughs> so, yeah. We are a child of Baal. We are a Baal spawn. And the whole prophecies, uh, the, all of the prophecies of Alondo about, you know, the god, the lord of murder spawning a score of mortal progeny and, um, you know, one of which we are, of course. And then, you know, chaos will be sown in, from their passage and all that. Those all, uh, those prophecies concern this time right now where the Ball spawn, the children of Ball, come of age, and they will, as the notes from presumably Saravok said, they will, through bloodshed uh, and misery, try to inherit Ball's legacy. Dang, man. So th this is some heavy stuff. Anyway, my two minor gripes with Grand's letter is that, first off, it ends kind of abruptly. I wish there were were a couple more a couple more lines in here, and the second one, just a general thing. I, I wish there was a little bit more that Grian could leave us with, either some piece of information or some kind of unique, maybe keepsake, some kind of item or something like that that would provide us with the advantage of being Grian's ward. We are going to be known later in the saga as Grian's ward, and um, you know. I wish there was like a little, some sort of little advantage coming from that. But anyway, he also mentions Saravok, of course, that once is killed. And now that we know what we know about us being a ball spawn, now everything makes sense. And I'll just take a moment here to point out the different references and hints that uh, we've already encountered throughout the game. I was actually making a little list as we went through the through the playthrough, so I could point out all of them. So, of course, at the very, very beginning of the game, and after returning to Candlekeep, we have these chanters chanting Alondo's prophecy, you know, about the mortal progeny, the ball spawn, and that chaos would be uh, sawn from their passage, and all that. So, like I said here, when we returned that uh, yellow chanter, this is basically all you need to know. You know, <laughs> he explains the, the plot here, um, or the setting, I guess. Um, quite well. Then of course in Beragost we had the quest from Firebead Elvenhair where he wanted us to get a book, a History of the Fateful Coin, which mentioned some people whose coin uh, like stood at, at an edge that their fate is not determined. So this is not entirely related to just us being a ball spawn, but this is going to be kind of something related uh, to us later. But anyway, as a reward for that quest he gave us the History of the Dead Three book where um, it explained how Baal ascended to godhood by defeating, together with others, the evil god Jergal and taking the murder uh, part of his portfolio. Then we, we met this hermit called Portal Bendarwinden, who mentioned that our dark aura was hard to look at and that we had some kind of internal conflict within ourselves. Then when we charmed Dinaher, 
and she revealed that she was actually looking into Alondo's prophecy and looking for ball spawn, maybe looking for us. And this is not, you know, 100% entirely explained. And then we met this palm reader, Arkushul, on the coast, who freaked out when she wanted to, to see what our origins were, because she just was, was describing our childhood and whatnot, and then when she tried to look into our origins, then she just freaked out and wanted to do nothing with us. Wanted to have nothing to do with us, I should say. Uh, then, of course, Elminster, on many occasions, had some warnings about us making enemies within ourselves and talking about our bad blood and stuff like that. Uh, Amelia from Koran's NPC project could also say that, uh, you know, if you uh, wanted her information, because she was a succubus, uh, she had some, you know, <laughs> some info from the planes, I guess, being able to travel uh, between planes and not being, you know, a mortal creature. She could tell us also that we are a, a demi-human in nature, basically, and, and had some divine blood within us. Then we met this harper, Antilles Folsom, in Baldur's Gate City, who said that one is not forced to walk in the steps of their father, directly referencing Baal, and um, also mentioned our father, uh, you know, in, in his dialogue. Then we've met this Gaxir the seer, and uh, <laughs> yeah, Gaxir, who happens to be a seer, um, who also mentioned that we are more than we realize. Then we met that uh, woman, Lantanara, and the splurging sturgeon that told us about her dream, about us being a god, um, and also an iron statue that crumbles, and that is going to be a direct kind of reference to the ending of the game, as you will see. Uh, then Shlamsha, of course, the sewer king, also told us that we were a child of fate, uh, whose death was foretold and even planned by the gods themselves. And then... Of course, we have Saravok, right? He wanted to kill us at the very beginning of the game. That armored figure is, of course, Saravok. We can easily kind of deduce that now. That, of course, he wants us dead because we are a ball spawn. So he sent assassins uh, after us throughout the whole game. Um, in the intro, when he uh, kills that, that guy, throws him off the tower, he says that he will be the last, obviously referencing Alondo's prophecy. In, um, in the letter to the Ogre Mage Assassins, he mentions that he's destined for great things. And so obviously he wants to inherit the Ball's legacy. Uh, we can kind of conclude through all, the, all of that we've learned throughout the game. Of course his acolytes, the faithful, they were also the faithful because they, they knew about his Hill's ball spawn kind of, you know, uh, origin, and um, obviously planned his success and to be his, like, right hands as he ascends to godhood and whatnot. And then the Ogre Mage Assassin also talks about the son of murder, murder that paid them 10,000 gold for our head. So son of murder, referencing, you know, Saravag, that he is also a child of Baal. And also, I just wanted to say how really nicely all of this works in terms of even game mechanics because whether you choose to min-max your character or have some kind of like a quote-unquote illegal thing about your character it all can be easily explained by you being a ball spawn you know you're supposed to be exceptional like for example if you max out all of your stats and put like all 18s in there or something like that you know well that can be you know those min-max stats can be explained by you having divine blood in, in yourself you know you're a ball spawn so you're not uh, like an average person and then anything illegal like a chaotic good kensai for example i think that makes a lot of sense because kensai normally cannot be of chaotic alignment but since we're a ball spawn and you know chaos will be sawn from our passage I think um, there's also the, there was that one note by Saravak I think that mentioned that whether we are good or evil aligned, chaos will follow us, and that's basically the thing that comes with with the territory, I guess, of being a child of Baal. So yeah, and no matter also the amount of kills, for example, we have like over 400 kills, and in general during the game, you know, you of course fight a lot, you kill a lot of people. And that can also be explained by that kind of destiny of ours, you know, no matter how good of a person we try to be, death just follows in our wake, and we can't escape it. There are going to be references to that later on in, in the saga also. So, yeah, like, everything makes sense, both gameplay-wise and, and uh, plot-wise. 
Now, from the NPC project, there's going to be some reactions. There's going to, in our party, I think only Jahira is going to, to say something. Yeah, so it's not that, that we read the note from Gryan, and here it is again, of course. And now Jahira should, should say something, and this is all from the NPC project, like I said. Sanashira, the growing crease of worry on your face as you read that letter makes me grow worried. Is there something so upsetting in Gorion's words? Since I knew him well, I might be able to explain. So here we can, like, accuse her of knowing that we were a ball spawn all this time. And then if you actually take this conversation path, you can actually call her a Harper whore. <laughs> but we're not going, to, uh, not going to go that route. And we're going to say this. I don't think you could, Jahira. You see, Gorion is not my true father. I am one of the children of Ball. I am a ball spawn. You are one of the children, then. So that is it. I knew we were somehow special from the way Gorion chose to abandon his adventuring days and seek seclusion in this fortress. I should have been able to guess earlier from those nightmares you were having. Oh yeah, of course, the dreams. Uh, I forgot to mention. Also, they directly point in our inner voice and whatnot. The dreams that spoke of blood. And also in the dreams, uh, a lot of... Uh, there were a couple of times where a dagger of bone appeared and that's kind of like a trademark thing of ball one of his avatars i think ravager is basically able to like spawn these bone daggers out of his body and like launch them at opponents like in the lore and um we're going to see something like that uh, later on in the game so though those bone daggers also were a clear reference and this is why Jahira is ultimately awesome uh, on, underneath. This is like very true to how she is in Baldur's Gate 2, because obviously this is not written by the original developers. But as you know, my opinion about the NPC project is that it's just so close, so well written, and so close to the original kind of material that you wouldn't really be able to tell the difference. And this is very much in line in how Jahira is as a person in, in Baldur's Gate 2, where, you know, she has her attitudes and... She can be annoying, and I give her. A, I love giving her a hard time, <laughs> but ultimately she's she's awesome, and she together with Imwen, she is like your closest link to to Gorion. She's kind of like your family, and she says, "This changes less than you might have thought, Sinashira. You have shown yourself as a decent and caring person despite this heritage. I will continue to stand by your side and help you come to terms with this newfound knowledge, if you would accept my aid, of course." Yeah, so thank you, Jahira. That's kind of a little weird that Imoen doesn't have any anything to say from the NPC project. You would think that, you know, with all the content that NPC project provides for Imoen, that she would say something here. But apparently not. Anyway, this was an awesome moment. I love that revelation. That kind of realization of, you know, what we are, what was going on, or... Dang, man. And I mean, I, I'm like, dude, like, I, <laughs> I feel like I've uh, found out about this for the first time, man. It's some heavy stuff, dude. Anyway, we want to visit this room. There are some actual goodies in this one. Oh, wow, another cloak of protection plus one. And a potion of defense, which I wanted. And I think here there's not much... Anyway, now, if we travel over or um, into the, the sixth floor, the, the next one, uh, we are going to be approached by a dude that is going to want to arrest us. And uh, yes, that is right, arrest us. I'm going to only go with, uh, I think, Senashira, with the boots of speed and one potion of invisibility. I mean, of course, we have our scroll case. We really should, like, get rid of these letters <laughs> from the, like, Iron Thrones command. All, all of these letters to, like, Nimble, Molahe, and stuff like that, but they are relevant, man. <sighs> Alright, let's just give these scrolls of web to someone. I guess Yeslik is going to be the keeper of, of some scrolls. And of course we're going to hold on to Gorion's letter, of course. Anyway, so I'm going to go upstairs with only Senashira. 
Now there's uh, the gate warden, like I said, if he's going to approach us and uh, want to arrest us, basically. So what I'm going to do is kind of kite him over, th over here. And I'm just going to go invisible. <laughs> to kind of get him out of the way so he's here and doesn't bother us anymore. And now we can loot some of the rest of the, the stuff. Actually, I should bring Koran over and I hope he doesn't... He's... Not going to be in the vision of that gate warden. That's very nice. Because there's a chest that I want Koran to open here. Certainly. Oh yeah, there's protection from petrification. And protection from normal missiles. And uh, ghost armor. Anyway, here's all round. Kind of the the leader of Candlekeep. The, he has like the highest position. But he's a... He's a schmuck. <laughs> As you will see uh, later. Uh, you can kill him, by the way, although he has some pretty insane stats. He has minus 20 armor class, he has 100% magic resistance, and he has 932 hit points. You heard that right. Over 900 hit points, but you can kill him. You can you can go through that. And but he only uh, he only gives you 4,000 experience for all this trouble to kill him. He only gives you 4,000 experience. My station is much greater than that of Teth Torils. Hmm. Like listen to him. He's just a, a wimp. Teth Toril, like you you could you could never match Teth Toril in any regard. Yeah, he's he's busy. Nothing comes out of talking to him. So here's some gold and a couple of potions that I wanted to get. And here actually is going to be Tethtoril, our dude, our best buddy. And I'm going to kite him a little bit away <laughs> from the chests that are or containers that are up there. All right. So how are you doing, Tethtoril? Yeah, hast thou come to collect the inheritance from your father? This could be understood in more than one way. He left these several items, all of which are within his old room, but of course he means Gorion primarily. And I guess this was a plan for Gorion to leave you something more from like earlier in development or something, and this is just kind of like a leftover because obviously there was only the letter. Yeah, and he also mentions where Gorion's room is. And he says that it is important that we later speak of your foster father, but not now. Well, we're not going to have the opportunity, unfortunately. So anyway, we still haven't found these Iron Throne leaders, right? And they were on that lower floor in that conference room that I mentioned. There's another wand of missiles and a ring of protection plus one. Uh, this one I, I'm going to take. Anyway, so now we're going to go to that room and meet up with the Iron Throne leaders. And basically the thing... You know, with this this whole um, exploration of the Candlekeep library, uh, the, the thing with the arrest that the Gate Warden wanted uh, to do on us is the fact that these Iron Throne leaders. Now well, let's first like get to that situation, it is done. and then I'm going to explain everything. Also, in regards to Saravok's ring that he wanted to give us. That's just, uh, by the way, that Kovaras is a ring of protection. That, that's just a ring of protection plus one, but it has a unique name. You probably can't identify that, right? Let's just have Yeslik hold on to that. Anyway, this is a very significant encounter here. Oh, let's not get, get into their vision just yet. I don't think I'm going to buff up, like almost at all. Maybe let's let's uh, buff up Seneshira's armor class a little bit because they are wimps, pretty much. We're we're just going to do a little bit of Armageddon tactics, and that pro that basically is going to wipe them out. Yes. Pretty much. So let us approach. Certainly. I don't have time. So he is here is the man himself, Rieltar. After all this time, after all uh, the times that we've heard about him or led, uh, read his letters, finally here he is here. My dear ma'am, you must realize that it is manners that make the gentlewoman. So would you kindly prove that you are one by leaving? 
is uh, here's the Realtar and the other Iron Throne leader Brunos and these two guys are actually uh, representatives of the Knights of the Shield and those are actual uh, characters from the Forgotten Realms lore there is Tuth and Kestor who is actually a very similar name to Questor from Gauntlet the elf anyway so uh, NPC project has a pretty cool comment from Koran we will do what pleases us and if you do not like it well, here is your chance to make yet another attempt on Seneshira's life. Our previous assailants have failed, failed, fallen to her hand. <laughs> this is a good response to, it would be a sad day indeed if I took some pointy ears rogues threats seriously. But anyway, here is what matters. Of course, Yeslik has his own private business to settle here. Manners, is it? Like the manners that you're supposed to enter a dwarf or you're not supposed to enter a dwarf's home if he doesn't invite you in, or the good nature to not trample over the graves of his kin? How about the common courtesy to not lock him away and torture him for days, Railtar? Are those the manners that make you? Are they? You filth? Oh my god, yeah! Tell him, yes, like, yeah! Dude. <laughs> this is an awesome response. Yes, like, then Cloakwood has fallen. Damn you, dwarf. There may be safety for you in this library, but I assure you, outside of here, there will be nowhere to hide for you. My safety is not what I'm thinking of, scum. I say you draw steel now, and by Klangadin's will, get cut down like the dog you are. Add them, Seneshira. So you can, of course, uh, stop him. Normally, of course, if you don't have Yeslik, there is a different type of conversation with the Realtar here, and you can just back away peacefully, or you can actually uh, fight them and kill them. And this is basically what I was referring to with that gate warden that wants to arrest us. Even if we back up, uh, back out of this uh, conversation peacefully, uh, because you're, you know, you're supposedly not really s supposed to, uh, you know, fight within Candlekeep and stuff because you're going to get arrested and stuff. Basically, the thing is, we get framed for their murders, even if we back out here. They die anyway, killed by someone else, and we get we get framed for that. The gate warden wants to arrest us there uh, because we are apparently, uh, you know, we've been spotted. Which is kind of weird because they only have one witness when you ask about that. There's only a man by the name of Kovaras that apparently saw the whole thing and, uh, uh, you know, and um, th that's all the, all the witnesses that they have <laughs> when it comes to accusing us. So yeah, we get framed, and of course, if we accept Kovaras's ring, there then there is a little bit more weight to those accusations because apparently that ring uh, belongs to one of these guys. So if we are found uh, with that ring on our body, you know, that Kovaras gave us that ring, of course, then that is m more evidence that it was us who murdered them. Uh, so that was that's why I guess Kovaras was pretty displeased with the fact that we didn't accept that ring but it doesn't it doesn't change anything we're going to get arrested whether we kill them or or not anyway so of course we're with you yes like of course we are vengeance is here realtar for clan orothiar so yeah of course we're going to now deal with them uh Toth actually is a pretty good fighter and so is brunos uh castor is nothing special he's a thief that uh, I think he has darts of stunning or darts of wounding, I think, that that he throws at us. And Realtar is actually the most underwhelming of all, because he is, I think he's only like level 5 or something, he's very low level, and he doesn't even come with uh, much protections at all. Anyway, let's blow them up. And, um... Unfortunately, Yeslik is probably not going to get the killing blow on Realtar, but at least let him try and use his sling. So yeah, Realtar only has shield. And he just uses chromatic orb on Koran. That that is pathetic, Realtar. You call yourself a mage. At this point in the game, you just throw a chromatic orb at ourselves and you protect yourself with shield. I mean, dude, that is just pathetic. That's what you get for that. Boom! Okay, Realtar is actually not dead yet. So, yes, Lick, go, go, go. He is all yours, dude. And we're going to deal with the other guys. Actually... I should probably charge in and get rid of this guy. It's a shame that Yeslik cannot use uh, wands, because I would totally use the wand of the heavens on Realtar now. He actually casts a necromancy spell, which might be 
uh, horror, so I will buff up with Remove Fear with the Eslick here. Okay, that's just Vampiric Touch, okay. You are entirely pathetic, Realtar. Okay, Yeslik, continue. You know, Yeslik needs to get close and personal when it comes to uh, dealing with Realtar. Go, 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 Yeslik. Maybe you can command him? Oh, whoops. Okay, you can't do anything yet. Okay, that's a enchantment spell. Alright, he is commanded. And now... Now, Yeslik. It's all up to you now, dude. Yeah, this guy has like 90 or something HP. He's pretty tough. Alright, Yeslik, go, go, go. Let, let us see you deal with Realtar. 8 damage, dude. He he failed his casting. Well, apparently... Oh yeah, that was the, the previous cast. That was interrupted by Yeslik's command. And now M.O.N. got... Receive some damage. Alright, yes, like one more time. Let's not have it look like what Branwen did. <laughs> Let, let's not have it take so much time. Alright. Boom! Final blow going to Yeslik. That is perfect. Rot in your own hell, merchant scum. Praise be to Clan Gadin. My job's done. My grudge is paid in full. And Realtar lays there with his brain pan open to the air. <laughs> It has Medulla Oblongata being, you know, in, in plain sight. I thank you, Seneshira, all of you, for this. Like, hell yeah, yes, like, of course we we would back you up here. All right, I'm glad we found justice for you, yes, like, we'd better go, though. Yeah, come, let's find the masters of this place and tell them why we did this. So, of course, we cannot... Uh, we cannot do anything about this. Like I said, the main story is going to progress normally, and we can get another potion of clarity from Realtar, actually, which is pretty nice. Now we have so many of these potions, these big potions of healing, that, um, by the way, in Enhanced Edition you can only stack potions up to 24, and uh, arrows up to 80, and projectiles up to 80, as you've, as you've seen, and I find this actually to be a pretty nice sweet spot, because in Classic Baldur's Gate 1, you wouldn't. You would be able, uh, and actually, in, in classic Baldur's Gate 2, when it comes to potions, you only would be able to stack them up to five, and then in Baldur's Gate 1, the projectiles only went up to 20, which was, you know, there was a lot of arrow management, in uh, in that way. And then in Baldur's Gate 2, projectiles went up to 40, but in Baldur's Gate 2, projectile weapons in general are just that much weaker that it doesn't really matter all that much. But anyway, the 80 projectiles and the 24 potion here. Um, it, th those are actually a really nice sweet spot where it's a balance between still having to pay some attention to it and have uh, you know uh, have to manage your resources a bit but it's not um, annoying that you know it doesn't take too much time and effort to do that because uh, I'm, I'm mentioning that because some mods allow you to stack infinite amounts so you could have like one stack of arrows in which you have 2,000 arrows, for example, and you just buy that at the beginning of the game and it just lasts you the the entirety of the game. And I don't like that that much, you know. I like to still have to pay a little bit of attention to that. And I think, since we're looking at the inventory, I think I'm going to switch out these belts for Yeslik and for um, Jahira. We're going to have these blunt belts on them, I think, to basically give them a nice all-around armor class because they have those this full plate mail of course that gives you bigger bonuses versus slashing and piercing and missile and all they need is a little boost to their blunt um, blunt damage armor class or crushing damage armor class and I've switched these belts out earlier for some particular fights and I didn't switch them back and yeah they, they have some like plus one gear like morning star and a medium shield plus one and he has a longsword plus one and a medium shield plus one. And this guy, yeah, has darts of stunning. So, yeah, that's that's it. And now, after we kill them personally, there's actually going to be a little bit more of these guys that approach us to arrest us. But that is something that we'll have to wait until the next episode, I think. So, in this one, I think it was pretty satisfactory, a pretty fulfilling episode when it comes to the uh, plot. 
and a little bit of action here. And in the next one we're going to have to deal with all of the consequences of us uh, killing these guys and being a ball spawn and we're going to go on and further the main story even further or further it more I guess so as always thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next one